Are we live? Mate, uh, thanks very much for doing this. You have been one of the most requested people to talk to. Um, so I'm really happy that we finally found the time to do this. Mate, two weeks after the season's finished, have you managed some downtime or what's been going on with you guys? Have you been reviewing? Have you managed to sort of catch up on life a little bit? Not really. So we we lost the quarterfinal um, on the Friday, travelled back on the Saturday, maybe had a day on Sunday, but then um, we the coaches then spent probably that week just fact-finding on the season, just in our areas. Yeah. Um, obviously, what went wrong, what went right, and then just fixes in for, for next year. And so that's uh, – I went through it last year for the first time, and I remember thinking last year, oh, we don't need a week. But if you do it properly, um, yeah, it, 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 you're almost running out of time, like when you present it. And it's a, it's a genuine presentation to the other coaches – and I remember just before my area was presenting, like it's 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 like handing in an assignment where you're just checking it one last time. You're going over it. Wits, Chris Whitaker went before me, and I liked how he saw some things in his area. So I sort of just last minute changes in mine. Yeah. So then we spent um, week two post being knocked out. The Monday, Tuesday, we were just in our areas presenting to each other. The S and C staff did the same. The medical did the same. Then Wednesday, um, the coaching staff. We then spoke about you know what's game day look like. What's the perfect week look like given everything that we've just been through the last two days. And then Thursday was awesome. Thursday and Friday, the heads of the other departments presented to everyone else. And then uh, almost you got to Friday. DC had finished. And then it was sort of like weight, massive weight off your shoulders, you know. Yeah. And, um, I guess now what we're doing is, is prepping for players one-on-one -on -one meetings. Yeah. Uh, and then that'll then formulate what their goals are before preseason starts and what they're doing in shoot shield. So in terms of having a rest, probably not just yet, but we'll get out of time. Like, uh, I think we try and get annual leave in when Chuchil finishes. Mate, what's your process of self-reflection like? Are you, are you hard on yourself? Do you allow yourself to look at things that you did well? Um, is it something that you can look at with an unbiased eye and really assess what, what you've done this year? Does, does that make sense? Like, how, how do you think about it? How do you look at it? I always um tend to lean towards being really harsh on, on myself and then if anything is positive it's because there's evidence of you know stats um so you back up so do you back it up with a statistical data yeah yeah, yeah. That, that that was one thing here is that you get data from everywhere and you can like there are things that you can judge by feel but you know, that, that those meetings are, there's a lot of stats in there as to why. And you're looking at the top five. So we came six. So what are the five teams doing yeah. above us? And then what are the teams doing below us? How did we rank? You know, which isn't new, right? Like like looking at it that way is not a new way to look at those things. But, um, yeah, you, you self-reflect harsh, I think. And then... Um, I think I have allowed myself to sort of look at a couple of things and go, yeah, look, that that worked really well. And you get player feedback and go, did you like that? Did you not like this? Yeah. Um, and so if anything is positive, I find myself, if it's positive, it's because the players have said it's positive, not because I've gone, man, I did that really well. Yeah. Um, is that something I need to fix? Maybe, but that's just the way that I have operated when I self-reflect, I know where I need to improve. And I think things that I need to be better at, I always try and get some feedback from the players or other coaches around me. What, what do you need to be better at? If you don't mind sharing, if, if that's okay. I think an area that I need to be better at immediately is just how I coach the attack breakdown. And 
where that fits in. The reason why I think I need to improve that is because of the way that I've always seen attack breakdown was um, as a complement to our attack shape rather than it being its own beast. And you look at other coaches that have been coaching the game a long time, it's genuinely its own little area. It's almost like a set piece. And so that's a that's a that's an area that I need to be better for for the boys. And I felt that I let the boys down in that area, and, and that was because of just how I saw it. And so, looking at it and looking at others, like just looking at how Laurie Fisher goes about his business in that area, it's uh, it's a genuine. It's it's like a set piece, really. So, so you've you've had that self reflection. Will you go away and, and look at ways? to to coach that better will you will you speak to people players is that is that how you go about you know improving your skill set in that area so that in the next preseason you can launch straight into it or is it just self-reflecting and no i if i self-reflect and i'm only going to hit the ceiling that i'm at you know like i need to figure out i need to go to you know world leaders in that area and talk to them and um and just seeing how other people operate in that area can can be something new as well but if i ever want to get better at something i'm not self-reflecting it i'm going to go and search answers outside um and immediately in that it's just watching how other teams operate in that area when they're attacking how they fall how they place it what are the support players doing um so whilst we're clear on the fixes in our areas. I'm in no rush to sort of fix that now. You know, like I'm going to take my time and talk to different coaches and and and, and players around the line out, around the attack breakdown, around malls. What are you guys doing for scrum? Um, so yeah, it, I think we're quick to try and figure out what our fixes are. I think we've just got to take our time in gathering a lot of information around how to get better in those areas. And then by the time the boys hit day one of preseason, uh, you know, we've refined how we're going to get better in that and then coach it and coach it hard. You, you were a shoot shield head coach previously, made the step up. What have you found the biggest differences to be between the semi-professional slash amateur and then working with full-time professional players? It's, it's pretty big. Like, and the other thing in that dynamic is being a head coach and being an assistant, like they're two totally different things. So I went through being a director of rugby and trying to look after 220 people plus tents and it's a crazy this job just quietly. Yeah, to then coaching 20 forwards that, you know, bar two, one or two who are ineligible, but coaching 20 forwards who want to be Wallabies. And so they're, they're keen, they're reviewing like I'm getting texts on my phone about mall and attack breakdown or scrum review. And I haven't even looked at it yet. You know, whereas I think at shoot shield, you're going, come on, has anyone watched it or what's your feedback on it? You know? So there's a, there's a massive difference in what I was doing at shoot shield to what I'm doing now in terms of job description. But I think just the difference is that the, the, the player, this is their job. I'm not having to worry about, He's been on the tools all day. So I've got to, you know, try and tailor training to that or he's going to be late because he's got a meeting. It's just when we're training, everyone's here. When they're recovering, that's where everyone is. So the biggest difference is just you just notice that this is their, this is their job. Have you found that you've become a better forwards coach, just coaches, just focusing on coaching forwards and not having to worry about the whole picture? Like, is that something that you've had a look at and reflected on? Definitely. I look back, I, I do a lot of reflecting on things that I've done at ACE. And I even look at, like, what was I coaching on that? I was just coaching so big, like you coach really big on it. Whereas now I'm really enjoying getting to coach really small and coach small detail. Just the other day, I was looking at um, just the game day sheet that I gave the ACE guys. There's a lot of info there. And then I'm going like, trying to remember the team list for that day and just going that message there only hit two players 
And yet I put it on the team sheet and told everyone to read it. And so 13 of the guys have read it and going, well, that's not to me. It's like such a waste of a line. Then I compare that sheet to what I'm giving the sheet here where I've got, and in some positions, we're coaching some of the best players in the world. And it's just, it's, it's almost a third of the information. You'd think that it would be swapped. Yeah. But for the guys that can take it, less info for, but it's, and I look and reflect on how I've progressed as a coach. And uh, I think in terms of if I'm better, I'm not going to say if I'm better or not, but I think I just, I can refine and articulate better what I want out of the player. And I know what needs to be said in a team environment. Then you've got a smaller group environment. Then you've got an individual one-on-one I, I wanted to ask you about that. I've, I've been lucky enough to watch you coach a couple of times, um, watch Palms coach a couple of times, Laurie Fisher. And the thing that stands out to me is the way that the messages are delivered. It's hammered home over and over and over again to the point where I think if you don't understand what's being said and what's being delivered, you probably shouldn't be in the room. Like it's To me, it was very, very clear. H- how do you think about, communicating your messages and and the points that you want to get across do you have do you have a process to to actually deliver that uh it definitely needs to be better uh it, it, it's something that i'm reviewing now with um with one of the, the the coach development guys at ra that works for ra and simply with more line out of scrum it's just what do i want these guys to get out of today and does my session plan or unit plan allow for that? And then if you stop someone, if I didn't tell the players, these are the two things I want you to get out of today, and we just did the session, if I stopped any one of those guys and said, what are the two things you learn? Is it through messaging that is it going to be the same thing that you said? You know, like, are you? do you only know those focuses because I've said these are the two focuses? Or can I take that away, run the session, and then you go, I've left that more uh, s- session, and I th- these are the two two main things that he wants. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's really interesting. And and, and it, th- there's no right or wrong in there. Like you can go, guys, these are the two things that I want, and you can preempt it, and then that then means that the boys know, okay, these are the things I need to tick off. Or you can take that away from the start and put it at the end and go, what did you learn? And if they're going five things or they're murky about it, then you go, well, then that's on me. Yeah. I wasn't clear enough. Am I saying too many things? Um, and so you just refine it that way. Mate, that's that's a very interesting way to think about it. I, I have you Have you experimented a bit with that to work out what's the best way or is it a little bit of a mix of both? Yeah, just a mix of both. And I need to get better at it. I, I, I definitely need to get better at that. And one thing that I'm really lucky that um, I get to watch Jason Gilmore at work every day. I think he's one of the great, great presenters. And um, how he checks in on the players to know, has the message come across? He's got some really good techniques to do that. They're not always the same way. But, you know, whether it keeps the boys on their toes because he knows you're going to ask. Um, but just watching him go about checking in on did they get what I wanted? Because it's fair enough. Like I can write on the session plan. These are the two things that they want. But have I checked in enough? Yeah. So you go, do you have it? And you can't, like, I can't keep checking in with Jed because Jed's in every little mini leadership group and he knows what we want, right? Like you got to check in on the guys that don't really say much and go if you if you're hitting the guy that's not in the 23 and and he knows it, Jed knows it, someone who's always in the 23, he knows it. Then I think you've done a pretty good job at conveying your message. But how important is building relationships with people? One of oh, he might be a mentor of yours as well. Matt, Matt Williams, did did you have him for the level four course? I did. I did. Yes. One of his great sayings is rugby is easy, people are hard. And uh, I can re- relate to that a lot. Yep. Um, you know, speaking to some of the guys you've coached, one thing they've all say to me is how great you are at building report and relationships with your guys. Is that something that's come naturally to you? Is it something you've had to work on? What's your, do you have a process for building those relationships with your guys? Um, 
Look, I, I, I know it's important and I do go, you, you, you make sure you go out of your way to make sure that, um, that you are building those relationships. You know, I, I like that and, and I can see why rugby is easy and, 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 and people are hard. Sometimes what I would say to that is sometimes people are hard because how you coach them. So, you know, players can get frustrated with that you're just not getting your message, you're not articulating yourself enough. So, you know, you could start off rugby easy, people are easy. You're not really conveying your messages a lot. Uh, well, you're not really connecting with a group. Yeah. And all of a sudden the rugby stays easy because rugby is a fun, you know, it's a principle-based game around ad line and support and ball retention. Then the people come hard. Yeah. So you've always got to make sure, how can I go rugby easy, people easy? And I think one of the, the first things is connecting. And then I think a, a second thing on that is you've 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 got to earn their trust and they're only going to trust you if you know if you know your stuff, you know. How many times do you go, you ask a player, oh, how's this coach? And they go, mate, great bloke. But he just struggled with, and it's always a detail. Yeah. If he's not a good bloke and you go, how's this coach? You go, oh. He knew his detail, man. He was so good around this technically, but he was awkward human, but may he knew his stuff. Yeah. So whilst the it, it is important to get a connection, and, and and I feel that's just who I am as a as a person. I like making people feel good and you know um, feel welcoming. But I'm always going to make sure that at the basis of it, that the guys leave here knowing that that they just trust me, you know, with. With, with what I'm coaching. So <clears throat> I liked it when I read the, well, you know, I've, I've, I've actually heard that before, but sometimes people are hard because of how we drive it. Mate, I really like that. Have you, do you find it easier seeing guys every day as opposed to a couple of nights a week and then on yeah. a Saturday? Oh. Cause, Cause you get to know them pretty well every yeah. day, wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. You get to know what motivates them, uh, what doesn't quicker. You know, sometimes and, and when you say it shoot shield three times, if someone's working or they're injured, that turns into one time a week. And then sometimes, you know, they go up poorly for the next four weeks on that Monday session. I've got a job down in Wollongong. So there goes one session a week, you know, and so sometimes in four weeks, depending on the guy's job and injury history, you're seeing him four times. Whereas here, one, this is their job. Even if they're injured, you're seeing him. Yeah. And so you get to know, and sometimes when they're in that rehab group, you get to know them a little bit better because you're not having a coach on the run and accountability is a little bit, you know, you might give them a week off on accountability and go, look, if there was any questions that you need or things that you weren't understanding when you were in the group, uh, you're out for say three or four weeks. Let's really use that time now to really get your head around that detail and, and let's talk. And it's in those moments that you probably get to know those guys a little bit better and what drives them and how frustrated they are. And then all of a sudden he then comes in for his first session and you go, man, I, I know what he's been through, you know, to, to get here. And, um, you know, it's awesome to see him there. And then all of a sudden there's a trust built because you can, there's empathy there. And um, yeah. So it's, um, yeah, to get back to your question, it's so much easier to see them every day. Oh, I reckon you could really improve people as, as uh, rugby players as well you know, having them every day and you're only looking after 20 guys as opposed to 200 or whatever it was before right. you could, you could, have you seen that? Like you, you can really notice the improvement in guys and, and actually improve them as rugby players. Yeah. Because um, yeah, you have a chance every day to put those fixes in place. Like it's almost uh, you, you get, you can get your review within half an hour of the session finishing not even like not even that 10 minutes when the session's finished the training sessions up sometimes boys are figuring out what they want to do like we even have fixes in our morning sessions so we'll have a morning session of the line out something's not quite right we'll review it they have lunch then they can fix it in the arvo session immediately yeah, immediately. Then that Arvo session, they can review the Arvo session and they fix it for the next morning. It's this continual, you know what I mean? So, and that was one of the things that I found out. It's like, geez, it's like, there's almost no downtime. When you're in the season, 
because the analysts are giving you this info and it's, it's almost readily available. It's just so easily available. Plus you put in huddle and, 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 and whatnot as well. Um, you review it, they ask questions, and then you can almost, you've got an opportunity every day to fix it. And how, how do you, how do you review in season? Like, I I've, I was saying to one of my mates that I've, I feel like the shoot shields season is sprinting on a treadmill for four months. Whereas I could imagine with you guys, it's like sprinting on a treadmill with sharks and, you know, crocodiles chasing you at the same yeah. time. <laughs> how, um, how do you, how do you break down your week? So you just say you got a game day Saturday. Do you review that night with an eye to getting it out the next morning or, how do you do that without overdoing it with players and looking after yourself as well? Because I can yeah. I can imagine it's pretty stressful and mm. you know there's a lot going on. Yeah, there is a lot going on, and I think we're we're reviewing how we do all that as well. Um, typically, you play Saturday. Coaches will watch and code their areas Saturday night. Especially if you lose, you just want to you just want to get out of the way. Uh, if you win, you might hold it how, off. To, how to do you remove the emotion from it though? Because I'll be like, just say you, you, you've won. Fuck yeah, we won. But if you, you lost, well, the fuck, Jed fucked up that line out. Or, you know, I love you that know. You get on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, for example, like, or is it something that you can just look at analytically after a game and go, I'm just looking at the detail, take the emotion out of it? Yeah, that. I, um, if I was to give myself a compliment, one thing I think I, 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 I am good at is assessing something without emotion. Um, something my my dad's always taught me. And um, yeah, uh, I, I reckon most coaches would probably have that skill. Um, but yeah, we, we, we sort of review it Saturday night. We send it into our analysts on Sunday. He then uh, formulates all our stats, puts it into a stat sheet. We hold that off. We sort of send it to the boys on Monday. Um, and then we just review our areas, so a couple of key messages or clips on the Monday, and then we, we just get into the preview pretty much straight away. Monday, Arvo, we start walking through things, and then Tuesday, we just look forward. Yeah, so will you, even during the season, will you still review training and then yeah, just, yeah, just say you do a mall session on Tuesday, sure. obviously you got an eye to the next game. Absolutely. You'll go, all oh, right, you missed your role here. Your head's not in the right place there. Is, is that how you look at it? Yep, definitely. So we usually walk through attack. So, so, so say some new attack patterns that we're running that week on the Monday. If I have a new line out or a new more, we'll walk through that on the Monday. And then on the Tuesday, before we do everything at, you know, game-like intensity, we have meetings in the morning. So we might just review it or refresh what we walk through. Um, and then we'll even sort of try and marry it up to what we want to do that weekend so they can see the pictures as to why we're doing it. Yeah. Then we have Wednesday off usually if we go Saturday to Saturday. Then on the Thursday, we're usually reviewing what we did on, on the Tuesday in our team and then in our units. Um, then we go into the Thursday and then captain's run on the Friday. And then it goes again and again. Then it goes again, again and again. <laughs> how, do you, how do you look? So I've I've – just started coaching line outs. It's a fascinating area of the game. I've I've learned more of, uh, in the last year than I had in the previous five. Obviously, it's super rugby. There's a huge amount of strategy involved. Teams are changing calls and line outs every single week. And there's movement and defense and all sorts of stuff going on. How will you break down an opposition line out? You just look for um you firstly defensively. So I try and look at um, any other teams that I know that play similar shapes to us. So whether it be a, a five-man line-out, 3-2 split, or a 1-1-3 one, one, split, you try and, and even though they might run at a different tempo, but how are they defending that? And then, yeah, you just have a look at those things and then you marry it up to what works with us. How can we change it? I've actually seen other things that go, I like how they do that. Do we have the time to add that in? Yeah. Um, and then attacking wise, we sort of moved into everything's pod system based now defensively. Like I, I noticed the last two games we played this year, 
uh, maybe off the back of having a good line out, they teams will now just try and force you somewhere. So they'll just pot up and stay there. I don't really care if they get up. It's just we don't want you to play this area. And so we'll give you an uncontested area to where we think, you know, where you don't want to play from, which is typically at the front. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how I sort of do it. And, and I have a, a line out leaders meeting on the Monday. Yeah. So I'll give them a playlist of what I think will work and why defensively, how are they standing? Are they open? Who's closed off? Who doesn't like lifting? You try and figure out and go on six occasions, there's been an easy read where the middle guy can turn around and lift, but he doesn't. And so you sort of play on that a little yeah. bit. Um, but yeah, it's not too dissimilar to anything else. You just, if you have the time, you look at it, find out areas of weakness, where they're strong, um, give it to the players, and then you formulate a plan with them. Will they, do they have a fair bit of input? Because something, something I've noticed is, is you almost need those line out leaders on the field to be coaches on the field. Like, I'm lucky at the wildfires. Rob's a really smart guy and really knows what he's doing. Morgan in this the same. So I've, I've found them very helpful and have put a lot onto them. Is that similar to you? Or are you kind of guiding them or are they, you know, is it a collaboration or how, how does that all work with your line out guys? I think it's a bit of a collaboration, but um, I, like really lucky with the group that I've got. Um, Talani was awesome. Zane was great. Obviously, Jed's Jed's our main guy. Hugh Sinclair, Ned's Ned's awesome. So they're our line out leaders group. Um, what we try and do is I'll show them pictures, and then I'll show them a line out menu that I think will work for that week. And then that's when I get the player feedback on. They go, "This isn't really working for us." Um, who's out? You know, we got three hookers. And they all throw different. That's a big consideration as well. Yeah, so we try and get that information. So if I know that, say, Dave Parecki might be out, we go, look, we're not going to know that until Wednesday. So if these two are throwing, <clears throat> then I'll go, well, those two options are out. Um, and so we sort of think on that. Whether we did it well this year, I only like a certain amount of line out options in a menu. So if you like one and you want to chuck one in, we've got to take one out. Doesn't what, what's your thinking? But what's your thinking behind that? Is it just just to simplify it for the guys so they've only got to focus on a few things? That's it. Just simplify it. It's such an important part of the game, but um, yeah, it's such an important part of the game where it can really uh, influence the mood of a forward pack. Like if you just you lose three lineouts in a row, all of a sudden your backs don't want to kick it out on a penalty. They now start quick tapping. And you're like far out. You know what, what I've mean? seen is it can affect your callers' game for the for the other parts of the game as well. Exactly right. Then you've got to spend one or two lineouts in an area where the backs sort of go, "Oh, this is where we're going to launch here." And you go, "No, I've got to." If it's the if it's the hookers, you know, issue, we've got to triple slip to the front, you know? So we've got a couple of calls if things go pear shape. It's like, oh, yeah. these are the ones that, that will call. So it affects it. So I just think the less you're thinking about something, then the quicker you are. You know, you don't want any sluggish movement. So you just want just a call and we know it. And like you said, we, have, we, we walk through line out. We walk through or jump line out every day. And so there is really no excuse. So that, that's one thing I can say to the players is like, I'm taking options out so that we're sharp. So there's no excuse going, mate, there's 50 options on that. Um, and we give them the menu pretty early, like on a Monday or a Tuesday. Yeah. Then spend the Wednesday where they're not, you know, they can have a look over it. Um, I've got a database of all our line out options as well. Um, is there a collaboration with the attack coaches on yeah, what line outs they want, to, they want to use as well? So what I probably didn't cover, on the Thursday leading into a Saturday game, we start looking at the week, the next the, week. The following week, yeah. yeah. And so part of the preview is um, we probably look at that in our own areas and then when we get together, 
Chris might go, you know, there's a really good opportunity for a six man. And then I'll go, yep, yeah, okay. But if we have this lineup, then the six man's not great because they'll just two pot up, yeah. you know, and uh, which I've probably got to be a little bit better at just a bit of give. Like I think the Kiwis, we, Aussies, we pride ourselves on our lineouts. Like those Kiwis statistically, they were middle to back to lower end of lineout, but they're winning the game. So that goes to show they're probably just willing to roll the dice a bit on a lineout core to get the best attack. Or we're yeah. trying to win sort of everything. We're trying to win the air, the ground, and the attack shape. So um, yeah, that's just something that we've got to have a look at. Do they do they get into you about where you they want you to win the ball? Yeah, they did more so last year, I felt. <laughs> I'm saying, mate, I'm just going to win it for you. Yeah. Um, and so if that's the front, which like I, I, I got to give there. But I think um, as the number one principle is we, we've just got to win it. And part of that is calling to where they're not. And you can manipulate that. Like if they give us the front and they're only giving us the front, you can't just go to the front and throw it off the top because then they'll go, sweet, we're winning. At some point, do you maul down the front? Do you trick shot down the front? You make 20. Then all of a sudden, instead of them potting so far back, one of their front lifters go, then you go to the middle. Then you're winning in the middle. Then they'll give another. Then you can go. So I always say, like, we'll eventually get there. <laughs> And then their thing is like, what if we only have five lions and it takes you five to get to the back? So it's an it's an awesome discussion. But yeah, yeah we, th- there is collaboration around what's best for attack, what can we do? And then the selection of the team as well. It's like, what? Yeah, I can do six man and then we have a couple of injuries or we might go with a shorter lineup and we go, okay, well, then there's our six man gone. Yeah. So you see, so you go to a shorter line out where there's not as easy to cover space, or yeah, and just move them around a little bit. Yeah, what's what's your relationship like with failure? I the reason I ask is, I, I think I've said this every podcast I've ever done, but coaching's changed the way that I view failure. I used to be very afraid of making mistakes and you know looking stupid in front of people and that kind of thing. And then a couple of conversations I've had with coaches on this podcast have just totally flipped my mind on that to think that I want to try things. I want to make mistakes. And I've certainly made plenty. I've only been coaching a couple of years, but I'm looking at that as a learning experience rather than, uh, or these guys will think I'm stupid now. How how do you think about that? And can you share any mistakes that you might've made that have, that have set you up for later success? Um. I've got a really healthy relationship with failure, I reckon, because I'm not afraid of it. But whilst I'm not scared of it, you obviously try and minimise it. Um, but if I do make a, mis- uh, a, a mistake, I'm happy to go shake its hand and then move on, you know, front up to it. I think how I structure my weeks is it allows for mistakes. So I'm, I'm happy to make a mistake on a Monday and a Tuesday. And just go, look, we're going to try this. Could be wrong. Where I don't want to be wrong is a Saturday. Yeah, I don't want to be wrong on Thursday. I don't want to be wrong on Friday. And I definitely cannot be, and I won't accept being wrong for the boys on, on, on Saturday. Like that would genuinely break me if something doesn't work for the boys because I was wrong on it when I try and make sure that I foolproof that throughout the week. Yeah. So... I'm happy to meet failure every week, but if I can tailor it so that it's on a Monday, Tuesday, and you you tell it to, so it, it, it might be a line out option. And I might tell the B team, the team that's not playing, go, when we play this particular line out, can you defend it this way? Because I want to have a look. All of a sudden, the B team wins it. Like, All right, cool. Just keep moving on, crack on. Then I'll tell the B team, go, defend the same line out this way. Then you know, the B team wins it. So then you sit down with that line out group and go, right, that, that, sorry, that just didn't work. That was yeah. going different in my mind. What I don't want to do is go with it Monday, Tuesday, celebrate it on Thursday, let them do a captain's run. Then we get to Saturday and it's just like, wow, I didn't prep them for that at all. Yeah. So, did you, did you have that in shoot shield as well? Obviously there's less, less time to try things 
necessarily or is that just something you've acquired in the last couple of years no uh, i like the only the, the big reasons why i think i'm okay with failure is because i just don't think i know everything so i i know if i don't know anything oh I don't think I've ever walked into the room and gone, I'm the smartest guy in this room. You know, people would say, oh, this is what you should aim. I just don't see myself that way. And so I know that I'm going to make an error. But where I'll get your trust is I'll own up to the error and I'll just work overtime to fix it. And I'm just no issue. I Just where I don't want to be wrong is when I'm putting other people in danger or where I can embarrass them. That's where I don't want to be wrong. So I'll allow failure and, and I'm, I'm sweet with it because I just don't know everything. I, I found that if you go, sorry, boys, I fucked that up. Nearly everyone's okay with that. Rather yeah. than you just trying to brush over and go, oh, you know, you did the yeah. wrong thing there. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. 100%. I see that in coaches and players. Like you can even have a clip. And you can show a player that he's doing something wrong and he'll go, oh, but the reason why I did that is because this morning I turned left at this intersection. You're like, hey, you've got nothing to do with it. But um, it does come to some pretty exciting new ways to look at things when you can accept failure, I think. Um, that's just the way that I do it. Like I'm not here to preach on how people can work with failure, but that's just what's worked with me. I, I just I always ask because I just think it's really important to get that out there, particularly when you're doing any kind of leadership role or you're working with people. I, I think you're gonna make mistakes and people need to to be open to that, in yeah. my view. I'm wondering if your relationship with failure is better if you trust your environment. So I have a really good relationship with my leaders you know in, in my playing group i'm wondering if i'm comfortable with that because i know that it'll be picked up somewhere and i and, and i'm comfortable whereas if i didn't have trust in my playing group i didn't think that there was you know iq to pick things up or be honest about it would i then be more guarded in what i am willing to do yeah because of that i, I just thought of that just then I'm, I'm, because i'm looking at my group I'm just so lucky to have the group that I have and um, have been so accepting of me and how I coach and the times that I have been wrong, it's just been, Matt, I disagree with that. There's evidence of it. And then we go, yeah, let's just, I think this would be a better option. I go, mate, that's an unreal option. I can't believe I didn't see that. Mate, awesome. And then we sort of just move on with it. And and it seems like players like that kind of relationship with the coach as well. Like you're giving them a little bit of ownership. You're going, oh, that's a good idea. Let's try it. I, I feel like this generation of, of players really relate to that. Yeah. That's just, for me, that's not just a coaching thing. Like it's a human thing, really. Yeah. I just think that's a human thing. Like as a husband, I'm not going to micromanage my wife and just, you know, go my way is that's it like a healthy relationship is she feels valued and she makes me feel valued and to my kids as well like I've got a teenage son now like I want him to know that I trust him and 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 just with my mates and then obviously now with coaching so I think what genuinely works in everyday life around human interaction usually works in your coaching yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's just it's just being a human being, isn't it? I I found being myself probably the best thing. Like, cause I I used to I used to have very very low self esteem, and I used to always think that people wanted you to be a certain way. And then a couple of years ago, I've gone fuck it. I'm just going to be myself. I don't. Yeah. And and it's been it's been really really good. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't agree more, mate. And. There's no point a coach not being authentic and then he preaches the players to be authentic. Like if everyone just bees themselves, then we can get on with trying to be the best at what we're trying to be rather than, you know, everyone's just fake and then they're just waiting for the end of the day to come so that they can just relax and just be who they are. It's just everyone be who they want to be. Let's trust the people that employ us. You trust that I've recruited you because of that. Like that's part of the recruitment thing. What's he like as a human? Yeah. And so you trust those things in there and just be, I, I, I couldn't, 
advocate that enough. It's just, just be yourself because I think when it, you're prepping for when it doesn't work, at least you had to go and go, I was just myself, you know, rather than going, oh, I wish I was just myself there and trusted my instincts. So that would always be something that I would tell any young coach if they go, can you give me some advice? It's just like, do you know what? Jace Ryan, the All Blacks coach, I've got to know him a little bit just through text messages and whatnot, and he's been awesome. He always ends a text message, and I ran into him at the Crusaders Hall of Fame lunch. The last thing he says, he always, it's like his catch cry when people say, see you later. He always says to me, coach through your personality. I've heard him say that on podcasts before. And I was sharing with him my journey. We had similar journeys where we didn't think we deserved to be where we were. Like he was the Crusaders, I'm here at the Waratahs, you know, like, I know how I've ended up here. Like, you know, I don't feel worthy. And he goes, I was the same. And he said, you just got to coach through your personality, be who you are, trust. He was saying, trust the guy that employed you. And he said, trust DC that he's got you in there. He wouldn't get you in there if you're toxic. Get your relationship with the players. And then even when I shook his hand, said, mate, all the best with your prep into the World Cup. He said, mate, just keep coaching through your personality. He said it again. So that's sort of something there just to go with what you're saying about being authentic. Those guys who are, you know, at their peak, are still saying it just just be yourself have you overcome that because I, I don't think you'd be alone in feeling like that i certainly felt like it when i made the step up from being a second grade coach to a forwards coach i still feel like like i feel like i could do on this podcast i've had some of the best coaches in the world on you here. had some so good write-ups mate i have no idea how and i still like i know you and i'm still like a little bit yeah. you know i you know i can't can't believe i'm getting getting guys like you on here but how do you overcome that is it is it a matter of just getting some confidence from results or knowing that you've been true to your own self or yeah i i don't know if i'll ever see myself in that light i think that's just something that i've accepted but I've just got to make sure that in, in my humility that I'm not self-destructive. So whilst I will always see myself in that light, I owe it to the people that I'm coaching just to crack on. And um, I don't know if it's an acknowledgement where I go, look in the mirror and go, I belong here. I belong. Yeah. <laughs> if I just go, right, this is what we need to do to win. And then you just crack on, you know. And- I reckon if you ever felt probably like I belong here, that's probably when you shouldn't be there anymore, maybe. Maybe. I, I just know I will never, ever get that feeling. And and that's just a personal thing, but I'm okay with that. You know, I've had some people go, oh, mate, you know, you should really look into that and you belong. It's like, but I'm okay with it. Because mm. I, um, I, I, I think I work really hard. Like I, I definitely try and and go over and beyond for the group. And um, I think good work ethic is more important to me than just, you know, looking into a mirror and going, I belong. Like I always feel that if I've got good work ethic and I'm delivering in my area, um, that you'll get a response from the players. And that's the, I can believe in myself and not get the players buy-in. Yeah. Or I can see the way that I see myself and get players buy in. You're always going to get you, the, the end result is player buy in. Yeah, yeah, mate. That's a very interesting. I I feel the same as you. I feel like like I've got a lot of confidence from what the wildfires have done this year to kind of go. Yeah, maybe I know a little bit more than I thought I did, but I still feel like that. Yeah, like, I know like, what you mean. Like it's just something gnawing away at me, but I yeah. I think that might be a positive thing if you know how to use it. I agree. Yeah. Agree. As, as long as it's not, you just can't self-destruct that, that that's all. Like you can feel how you feel about yourself, but you're just going to make sure that whatever it is you're doing as a job that you're fronting up and, and doing that to the best of your ability. And I just know that whenever you self-destruct, you're not going to be able to deliver. What have you learned from Darren Coleman on life coaching? Accountability is the main thing. Like he is brutal on accountability, even to the coaches. Um, And we talk about authenticity. He's one. Like he's just authentic. He will not change. I think that's a family thing just quietly. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, I think early in his career, 
he was probably told to and then didn't really get anywhere. You know, be careful how this comes across. He's then gone down the road of I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna be authentic in to a way by him being himself, people have then knocked on his door to come and save it. Uh, and you, you know, I don't want that to come across negative, but do you know what I mean? Now I think there's Definitely. something like that where people go, oh, mate, you gotta change, you gotta change. And I've been privy to him going, I can change, but I just I just can't be bothered to change. So then you go, okay, well, as long as you're okay and not coaching professionally, then it should be sweet. And it's like, yeah, I am. I'm comfortable not coaching. I'm happy to coach shoot shield. He stayed. As soon as he's let it go, as soon as he's let it go, yeah. that's when it's come. Yeah. And everyone sort of knocking. Gordon knocked on his door. One LA knocked on his door, and then you know he's ended up here. He's being authentic, and but his his way of keeping people players accountable is is eye opening, and um, he's just ruthless with it. And we feel it as staff as well. Like I've known from my East days with him. If you tell him you're going to do something and then you don't do it, that's when he's the most disappointed. And because you get on with him, because you, yeah, because of who he is, you want to do well for him. Um, I remember in the old building, um, DC and I had only been in in here for about two months, and I was in the gym with um, one of the uh, SNC staff, and I said, "Oh mate, how are you finding everything with with DC?" He said, um, I haven't known him long, but already I don't want to let him down. And I think that's that's what he is. Uh, I think and he, I don't want to let him down because of the way he connects, you know, and you almost, to a degree, I want to do well in my part so that he does well in his. Yeah. Because of because of who he is. So what's that? What's that? collaboration like on a rugby front does he just leave you to to coach the forwards and break down and and jump in if he sees something that maybe you're not seeing or, or he has something that he wants or, that's or the attitude's not there or, or something you've literally just hit it that's that's what he does like um i think one of the the a, a good trade of an assistant coach is earning the trust of the head coach and a good trade of a head coach is trusting the assistant coach and so I don't feel he looks over my shoulder, but he's there. And I'll ask him, you know, what, what do you reckon about that session? And, or he might come up or, and he chooses the right time, like he'll radio in and go, because he sits in on the meetings, he might say, oh, didn't, the, you're at the front, the backlifter didn't get you know, hard enough forward in that mall. And so I'll then swing back around. Or if I've got my iPad out of the training, I'll, I'll, I'll have a look. But I always feel that he trusts me to coach my area. Uh, again, he keeps me accountable if things aren't going well or there's a trend um, or he'll check in or he'll go, look, I think we should do this. Can you figure out a way to do it? Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I feel I've never gone into a, a session or come in here to a day where I felt that he don't, didn't, didn't trust me, which just allows me just to do my job. Unreal. Mate, I've got a couple of rapid fire questions and I'll get you back to your day job. <laughs> what makes what makes a good we just started talking about it a little bit. What makes mm-hmm. a good head coach and what makes a good assistant coach? Having done both roles now. Uh, I think a good head coach is um it, it, it depends how you run it, right? But I think if it's in a professional environment, you've got to trust. You, you, you've got to be a people person and then I think you've got to have clear direction and we've got to look to you to believe in what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and then on a inter sort of woven way, we need you to trust the people that are doing their job. You know, just, uh, I think micromanaging doesn't allow people to coach freely um during the season so i think that's that's really important and then i guess as an assistant coach you've got to earn the trust as the head coach like he you're not allowing him to do his job if he doesn't trust what you're doing you know i think the beauty of a head coach the dream for me which is just was awesome for me at ace 
is I could just roam from drill to drill during the units and just have a look at things because I trusted I wasn't going, oh, I've got to be with the backs coach for half hour. So then you miss the forwards for half an hour. So um, the other thing that I think makes a good assistant coach is if they're a little bit innovative in what they're doing, like they bring new ideas in for the head coach to sort of just, this is what I was thinking here, mate, or this is what I, this is how I'm seeing this. So I think that might just be a little bit of a, a bonus if if you get that in your in your assistant coach who's like geez really in, innovative in his area i've been thinking about that a lot lately because you you want to sort of aim to do what the best are doing but if you only do what they're doing you're never going to be better than them yeah, so great. finding some way that's different that might be better or some strategy i think that's an, a really interesting part of coaching that i'm not sure just looking around is that common mm. I have found it easier to be to innovate as an assistant than as a head coach. Why, why do you think that is? Maybe because at the end of the day, it's his decision, you know, yeah. and, and you can come to the table to, you know, and just go, this is a way I think we can get better or I'm looking at it this way. What do you, what do you think? When you're the head coach or when I was a head coach at East, admittedly, I, I would head coach differently. But I don't know, because the buck stops with you, are you less likely to innovate during the season? But I think that's where sometimes you innovate in an off-season. You actually don't know if it's going to work. So you can be innovative there. Then you get to round one, you go, oh, that didn't work. But if you can somehow innovate and keep thinking and keep moving what you're doing and just keep fluid throughout the season. I reckon that's it's pretty dangerous. Like you're just constantly looking at a team that goes, mate, they've done it again. That'd be okay. pretty cool. I would be cool. It would be cool. I guess, I guess when you're the head coach, you kind of jobs on the line as well. So you, you don't want to, you want to try things yeah. without completely trying things yeah. and fucking it up. So <laughs> uh, I guess when you're, when you're a Wayne Bennett type character, you've probably got the longevity to, to really tinker mm. mate do you do you listen to books podcasts any tv shows documentaries anything like that you'd recommend do you know what i do and i did notice that you had not noticed um that you hadn't put out a podcast in a while i do Bubba, Bubba's been cracking the whip mate mm. i do listen to yours because I, I i like the guys that you've got on and i really like uh i like when you champion the like I loved Cam Trelaw's podcast. I thought that was awesome, mate. He was great, wasn't he? I, I, I'm with you. I, I read when you had Zach Beer on, um, read the little blurb that you put. I, I really rate Zach. Like he's spoken to him a couple of times. He sees the game really well um, and just a great human. So I listen to the Matty Johns podcast if I want a bit of a laugh, just a family one. I don't listen to his rugby league stuff, but just his relationship with the boys and how they crack on it. Like, crack the the the, the whips of the misses like that's it's a pretty cool family dynamic uh, what, do, what do you do to escape family yeah family time and maybe you know what I, I i'm i'm definitely showing how young i am in this job but i just love it like I, i'm i'm okay to be doing rugby all the time and i know I'll probably get to a point where you go, no, you, you can't do that. And I admit that I'm still very new to it, that I'm okay to be watching footy. I'll watch all the Shoot Shield games. Um, I'll then watch the European stuff and people will go. Oh, every mate. week? Every week? Yeah, every week. But because I genuinely love it. Like I'm not yeah. there going, all right, I've got to watch this game. Like either... Because I try and do the rounds at Shoot Shield on Tuesday, so every Tuesday I try and visit it. Like I'm, I'm now invested in that. Like I'm now meeting guys that I've coached against, and you go, mate, mate, you were awesome in 2018. You had this little dummy, and he's forgotten it, but I haven't forgotten it. And so you meet. So I'm excited by it. And so, so, you, so you've been going to some of the the trainings as well. Yeah. So I did that last year, and um, I got to over half. I'm starting with the teams that I hadn't got to last year. And so I just text the head coach and we'll go, mate, can I just come in and have a look at your set piece stuff? Other some coaches um want me in there again. So they'll they'll 
try and double up, which is which is which is cool. And you just use me out however way you want. But I get a kick out of going to other clubs and just seeing how they operate, what's training like, even a player. It's like, what's this player like? So that's been awesome. And so that's that's downtime for me. But I know there'll come a time where you, you, if you're doing this for years and years, that you would want one or two weeks with no footy. But I get a kick out of watching the shoot shield and how how guys are going. But downtime is just family. Like I, I love unwinding with with my kids and my wife's genuinely my my best friend. So we got a f- pretty good family dynamic at home. And my boy, my eldest, goes to boarding school, and so we miss him a lot. And so he's um, he's at home now during the school holidays, and we just love to sort of being around the campfire at home, even though we light the fire and within five minutes, the kids are back inside. It's just me and the wife out there. (laughs) To be even better. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But uh, that's how I unwind. And anything to do with the family is time more for me. Mate, I've always meant to ask this question. It's probably Bubba's. Bubba's probably the only person I've ever asked and might not be the best person to ask. But how how do you switch your brain off afterwards? So... Do you, do you, once you've left um, Daisyville for the day, is it boom into family life or like, cause I, I've been finding that I'll get home from Newcastle admittedly quite late at night and I'll be staring at the roof at one thirty, going, hmm, I wonder how uni are going to defend our mall this week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> have you found, I mean, have just, you found ways to switch your mind off? Just kids, mate. Like you have kids, you know, they, they're in your face about how to spell snake. And they spell it wrong. And you're like, okay. <laughs> Sweet mate, my kids love quizzes. Like so, we just give them quizzes. We're into Rubik's cubes at the moment. Um, so I usually get home around four thirty. So from four thirty to eight, I don't even have time like to to think about it. Like, and, and I'm genuinely interested in their day. Like, I want to know how they were going. I want to know how my wife's day was going. And by the time you have dinner, you sit down, you watch their movies, you do your homework. Then it's bedtime. Then I'm into the, oh man, how are we going to do this or that? And then so I try and allow one hour of work in there. Um, or yeah, sometimes that stretches out to, to two hours if you need to review something. But um, just having having kids around sort of forces that for me. I better get to work on that part. <laughs> I just had another coach actually. Another coach said oh, I need a need to find another way to I need to find a way to switch off. And I said, mate, have kids. Honestly. And then you'll be you'll be clawing back at your laptop. You'll be like, mate, get me in front of my laptop. Having fake meetings. <laughs> mate, last question. I so really, really appreciate your time, mate. This has been awesome. What what advice would you give 18 year old? you um i'm massive on not changing anything in my life so i would go back and go look you're about to get a significant injury you need to use your rehab time better and then the last thing is you're about to go into a a two or three year period of your life where you reckon your dad's words aren't important stay on course, trust in him. Um, that's what I would tell. And that, and then anything after that with those two things, I think, I don't know. I think I've, I failed a lot because of those two things. I had a significant injury at 19, first year out of school, did nothing in the downtime to get better, came back and I felt I was chasing my tail for years and years and years. And then just like anyone, 19, 20, 21, probably stopped listening to my dad, who is my hero and remained my hero in those three years by just, I don't know, so I was probably a little bit invincible and I know better. And then um, figured that out, sort of 21, 22, went back and just go, yeah, he's been right all along. So any advice, just advice. But do you think that that's set you up for who you are now and what you've done now? Yeah. Yep. So it's hard to change. Hard to change anything when mm. you probably like where you are now. But I could have done that and probably been here 
if I just did those two things. But it was just like that that injury thing. It was a significant injury. And then it was just never right again. And then, um, yeah, I always tell kids, like, just trust your parents. They always, they always say good things, you know. Mate, this has been a great podcast. Thanks so much for your time. No, bro. honestly, mate, when you asked me to do it, I was just thinking after you've had Wayne Smith and Ty Kef on, it's just pop, pop this on the bottom of the pole, mate. Just mate, keep this, this has been one of my favourites, yeah. mate. <laughs> no, when mate, are you um, when yeah. are you coming up to Newey? I've got east then south, then I'm coming up to to Newey. I'm going to do a, a day trip up there because Bubba wants to have a, a – because. I think like I, we did last time, I just come in, I think one hour before training starts, but Bubba's asked if I'd come up a little bit earlier yeah. and just sit in that office and whether you're there and he's there and we just chat through things, it'd be sweet. No, that'd be great, mate. I, I think we play uni that week. Um, so if you could rule out any of your Waratah <laughs> players that week, yeah. that, that would be appreciated, but um, maybe be good to come up and get your feedback on what we're doing. Yeah, awesome. Mate, you're a good man. Thanks for having me on. Give me a 